Today on The Novelizers, This American Life's Ira Glass, comedian Joe Firestone, plus Clark Jones and intern Kevin Carter. Now here's your host, Andy Richter. Did you know that F. Scott Fitzgerald took two and a half years writing The Great Gatsby? Lord of the Flies took five years. And J.D. Salinger wrote for almost 10 years before finishing Catcher in the Rye? Wasted years those authors could never get back. Years that could have been spent doing way more important things, like writing Catcher in the Rye too. The truth is, in this age of efficiency, it's an embarrassment that novels still take years to write. There must be a better way. And no, I'm not talking about ChatGPT. I'm talking about a path that still preserves literature's artistic integrity. Kinda. Hi, I'm your host Andy Richter, and I've developed the perfect three-step formula for making great literature in record-breaking time. Step one, you need a story. No biggie, movies have great stories. We'll just borrow those and split them into bite-sized pieces. Step two, we ask respected professional writers to take a brief break from their masturbation routines to novelize those scenes into chapters. We could stop there, but since it's the 21st century, step three, we get someone with a stellar voice like Michael Caine, or if he's dead, maybe Ken Jeong, to narrate those chapters into a podcast. That, my friends, is called progress. And we, my friends, are called... The Novelizers. This season on the podcast, we're novelizing perhaps one of the 10,000 greatest movies ever made. Of course, I'm talking about Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And here to summarize the story so far is my intern, Kevin. Kevin, catch us up. Hey, Andy, uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if you had a chance to uh, think about what we, we mean you had discussed you know, about me performing rap on the show. Oh, right. Absolutely. Just as long as you rap about the story so far on Wrath of Khan. All right, cool. I got you. It's a recap rap about the Wrath of Khan, and I'll tell you everything that has happened on the captain's log. The stakes high ashes on, so let's jump right in. I want to blather on. Savage commanding the Enterprise now. Yeah. Klingons attacking and taking her down. Sulu Uhura, the Doctor and Spock are seemingly dead as they lay on the ground. His simulation is not the finale. Captain walk in and then everyone rallies. Yeah, the special was showing to deal with the no one. The less of a savage as Miss Kirstie Allen. Yeah. Starship Reliant is out on a mission. Looking for planets to test out a vision. They call it Genesis. It's, it's a device to take a dead planet then prep it for living. Check off to rail our beach to the service. Something about it is making them nervous. Connors just scheming with all of his cleavage. He captured the men with the help of his servants. The guys, they try to appeal. But kind of tyrant, he tried to steal the power of Genesis. He's such a nemesis, he filled their ear with some slimy ass eels. Yeah. He tricked their minds to do devious coups. They take reliant, not regular screwed. Take off in peril, then tell Dr. Carol to give him the rain. She's like, I am confused. She calls the Enterprise, asks for help. Regular one is not going through hell. Something is fishy, and if you're not busy, could you come and save us if you're so compelled? Yeah. Kirk on his way to save everyone quick. Everyone quick. Yeah. But that's when reliant start hitting the ship. Hitting the ship. Khan's got the nerve to go and emerge. The Enterprise crippled is stuck in this crib. While Khan's distracted, the captain is scheming. He'll beat Reliant while Khan is a dreamer. Shields lower slowly, Kirk does it remotely, then fires the mission, and that's how he creams. Everyone's shaking, they might need some meds. Scotty walk in with a crewman who's dead. Yeah. Khan's wreaking havoc, Spock's raining savage. Check, I still got that damn meal in this day. What's the next step? Who's passing on? And will the option go to Montal Bond? The options are buried with Gene Rod and Barry, and now you caught up on the wrath of Khan. Hey! Yeah, the options are buried with Gene Roddenberry, and now you caught up on the Wrath of Khan. Thank you, Kevin. Our next chapter was written by Stephen Levinson, creator of this whole damn podcast, and narrated by This American Life's Ira Glass. Make it so. Chapter 9. Yellow Alert. In which foes are reunited, and our heroes are presented with the most terrible choice. Novelized by Stephen Levinson, narrated by Ira Glass. Hello? Anyone home? Shatner called out over the comm. Earth to Reliant. Come in, Reliant. Once again, the Admiral's hails were met with silence. It was as if the Reliant's captain was ghosting him. But not a ghost that rattles chains or howls in the night or shouts boo or makes his presence known in any imaginable way, but rather a ghost that's completely invisible and noiseless. In fact, less like a ghost and more like a regular-ass dead person. 
whose consciousness, whose mental activity, whose years or decades of lived experiences, whose loves and losses and pains and victories flicker in less than a moment into utter nothingness, total oblivion, and are no more. Like yours will, dear listener, inevitably. Shatner turned to Ahura. Are you certain we're transmitting? Hmm, let me see. Ahura answered thoughtfully. For the past uh, 30 years of my career, my sole responsibility has been sitting in this chair and pushing the button marked transmit. But, hmm, great idea. I'll check to see if I forgot to push it this one time. Then without ever breaking eye contact with Shatner, she continued. Yep, we're transmitting. Asshole, she added. With its screaming klaxons and flashing lights, yellow alerts did little to focus the crew during an emergency. Quite the contrary. But they were very effective at changing the subject after your comms officer subjected you to a sick burn in front of all your buddies. Yellow alert, ordered Shatner. The lights dimmed unhelpfully as the bridge was bathed in an ominous red glow and alarms blared. Incoming message from the Reliant, O'Hara shouted over the den. They say their chamber coil is shorting their comm system. Well, that would explain everything. Cancel yellow alert, demanded Shatner. It would not, Spock replied coolly as the lights returned to normal. Chamber coils are not a thing that spaceships have. It pains me to agree with this inhuman, green-blooded freak. But goddammit, Bill, even I know chamber coils aren't a thing, agreed the lovable McCoy. Yellow alert, ordered the Admiral. He guessed a glance at his bridge officers. Every day they didn't mutiny was frankly a shock to him. To a man, they were more qualified to lead, even McCoy. And yet, day after day, they dutifully showed up to obey Kirk's orders. Their passivity disgusted him. Why didn't they transfer to another starship? Or even a desk job, for God's sake? What were they waiting for? The moment their captain would finally fuck up, and they'd have their crack at the big swivel chair? Because he did fuck up. Constantly. Twice a day. Minimum. He'd violate the Prime Directive by screwing some alien ambassador on the cusp of some breakthrough treaty signing, order the ship's computer to self-destruct for the flimsiest of pretenses. He'd personally lead deadly away missions and Temi felt like some fresh air, strip off his shirt and fight virtually anything or anyone. If Starfleet had an HR department, he'd never made it past Ensign. Maybe that's what Reliant was up to. Maybe Chekhov, the one that finally extricated himself from Shatner's insufferable rule, had returned to liberate his comrades. Back on the Reliance Bridge, Khan sat back, luxuriating in the rich Corinthian leather of his captain's chair, while basking in the muddled sounds of chaos emanating from the Enterprise's still-open comm channel. The shields are still down, said Joaquim, who was spending the summer as Khan's intern for college credit. Joaquim, I would like you to annihilate their engine room using our space cannons, Khan directed. Aye, Captain. Joaquim raised his open palm to slam the launch activator. Ah, ah, ah! Patience! Khan thrust a finger in the air, momentarily halting the launch. I've been waiting for this day for a long, long time. I'm determined to enjoy every last moment, caressing it, savoring it, like a fine French orgasm. Khan always talked like that. Always. So, uh, should I fire in the Enterprise, or... Yes, Joaquim. Khan shook his head, with other contempt, as if the very question made him weary. How do I put this in a way that you'll understand? My eager young pupil, you're trying too hard. Wait, you're the one who spent every waking moment of the last decade plotting to destroy Kirk. Perhaps. But observe my posture. Listen to my voice. I may want James T. Kirk dead, but I'm not being weird about it. In our line of work, the term is sweaty. Can you destroy that ship in a way that's not sweaty? Well, now I'm feeling really self-conscious about it. How do you push a button in a not weird way? Rather than respond, constantly reached down and pressed the rocket launcher himself. Nonchalantly, as if he was merely waving off the offer of a fine cognac. And fuck, if that son of a bitch didn't look super suave doing it. The rest of the bridge crew broke into spontaneous applause, while Khan took the slightest hint of a bow, then directed his attention to the view screen to enjoy the destruction. A hail of explosive missiles slammed into the unprotected underbelly of the Enterprise's engine room. Bits of metal, valuable electronic components, 
two totally innocent kittens were sucked into the deadly vacuum of space. A noxious green gas burst out from exposed ductwork, flooding the chamber. It was a total shit show. Just like the Kobayashi Maru, except this time it was absolutely real. And Shatner couldn't cheat his way out, as per usual. The Admiral was jolted into his chair. What the? he screamed. Why would another Starfleet ship be firing on us? Must be the damn chamber coil acting up again. Still not a thing, said Spock. More likely, the Reliant has been seized by a hostile force. Your orders, Admiral? Evasive action, Mr. Sulu, Shatner commanded. Any uh, particular evasive action you'd like me to take? Asked Sulu. Or should I just wing it as usual? You have your orders. Five decks below. Disoriented engineers ran across the room, bouncing off the walls, the ceiling, and each other, in a mad attempt to save themselves from a cold, quick death. Keeping outer space on the outside was the primary task of any starship, but on this count, the Enterprise was failing miserably, and nobody knew this better than her chief engineer. Scotty scampered hither and yon, frantically calling out life-saving orders in his unintelligible Scottish brogue. An engine mask is automatically lowered from the bulkhead. To start the flow of oxygen, pull the mask behind you, laddies. Place it firmly over your nose and mouth. Secure the elastic band behind your head and breathe normally. Shields up. In fact, does anybody know why we don't just always keep the shields up all the time? Asked Shatner, inadvertently doing a 23rd century version of the old why don't they make the whole airplane out of the black box routine? They somehow knew exactly where to hit us, spake Spock, speculatively from the bridge. The odds of that happening by chance or less than one in a hundred. You cold-blooded alien monster, shouted McCoy. These are human lives we're talking about. Lives of your fellow crew members, tragically cut short. And yet it's nothing more than a game to you, isn't it? You horrific, unfeeling zombie. McCoy paused before glancing up at his fellow bridge officers. Too much? Sulu held his thumb and forefinger aloft, a mere inch apart, while wincing, the universal sign for a little bit. As I was saying, Spock continued, phasers are depleted, shields are fried, life support is trashed, and the warp core is a warp no more. In retrospect, it was probably a mistake to store all of our essential systems right next to the engine. No sooner had Spock uttered these words than the whole ship's bridge was struck by yet another round of missile fire. Sparks flew, a control panel burst into flame, and a fog machine rented for the Enterprise's upcoming Dance Among the Stars prom ruptured, filling the room with thick, romantic smoke. It was quickly becoming clear to Kirk that this was the least successful mission the Enterprise had ever encountered. Worse than the time that they stumbled upon an alternate dimension where everyone was exactly like them except giant assholes. Worse than the adventure where the ship was filled with tons of adorable furry creatures and the crew had to love them all. Even worse than the episode where Spock got dangerously horny and the entire team had to gang up to get him laid. Admiral? Message coming through from the Reliant, O'Hara said. Shatner lifted a water bottle from his console unscrewed the lid, and emptied its refreshing contents into his waiting mouth, swishing the cold liquid back and forth inside his closely shaven cheeks. Ahura continued. They're asking us to surrender. At first, the water shot out of Shatner's mouth like an Icelandic geyser. Slowly, over the course of several seconds, the torrent evolved into a fine mist, before finally petering out into a delicate waterfall. It covered everything in its path, shorting out several of the electronic consoles that had somehow avoided being damaged in the previous laser volley, and completely soaking the hapless Sulu. Womp womp. s s surrender gurgled Shatner, as a bit more water dribbled out into his shoe. We have visual contact with the Reliant. Shall I put it through? Please don't, begged Sulu, telling off his face with the rag he kept handy for just such occasions. On screen, barked the Admiral. As the picture resolved on the monitor, Shatner rubbed his eyes in disbelief. The man staring back at him, occupying the captain's chair of the Reliant, was wearing some sort of strange half-cardigan, half-scarf, mouse brown in color, rope-like in design, which simultaneously violated every law of fashion, taste, and physics, and its ability to remain affixed to his torso, while somehow also revealing every square millimeter of his chest hair. It was obvious that his superhuman, genetically enhanced man nipples had remained supple and unblemished despite years of exposure to the harsh sunlight of Seda Alpha 5. Khan's head was covered with the blonde gray bouffant mullet hybrid that he made popular throughout Sector 25712 of the Alpha Quadrant. 
copper bangles, leather necklaces, and iron chains adored the man's wrists, torso, neck, and, Kirk could only assume, genitalia. Dad? What? asked Khan, momentarily ruffled. No, it's me, Khan, your arch nemesis. You left me defeated and condemned to rot in a penal colony. You don't recognize me? It's probably my new look. Do you like it? No, Shatner lied. Why were you fired on my vessel? Hmm, let's see. Maybe because you left me defeated and condemned to rot in a penal colony? Ron, if it's me that you want, why destroy my entire ship? Let these innocent people go. Just kill me. Mansulu. I offer you a counterproposal, responded Khan. I let them go if you give me the secret of Genesis. Well, most modern biblical scholars agree that there were three distinct authors. Please do not insult my intelligence, Khan spat. That's my tailor's job. Let's start again, shall we? I want all the information you have about the Genesis Project. My finger is now seductively encircling the button to my ship's laser gun, and I would like nothing more than to fire. What is your answer? Chandler cleared his throat. He and Khan were engaged in a high-stakes game of three-dimensional chess. Not like the common expression three-dimensional chess people on Twitter throw around when speculating about Trump. In Star Trek, 3D chess is an actual game. Because in the future, I guess, regular chess is too vanilla. Google it. I accept your offer. But the Genesis file is on a pen drive in the pocket of my other pants. I need more time to find it. At least a minute. Khan grinned and hit the record button on his view screen so he could capture this moment for the annals of history. Plus, he was going to post it on his TikTok account using that photo that would make it look like Kirk was sobbing. I give you 60 seconds, Admiral. Oh, I wish I could listen to that chapter all over again, right now. But instead, I'll turn things over to my intern, Kevin, who interviewed one of the fine folks who brought the film Wrath of Khan to life. Kevin, who did you talk to this time? Hello. Today, I'm here with Clark LaRue Jones, who was tragically removed from the final edits of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Hey, Clark, how's it going? It's going well. Tragic is a, um, is a euphemism for way too early. Before we get into the, the disaster of you not being in the movie, um, first let's get into why and what made you want to become an actor. What made me want to become an actor is I saw like people telling stories of just walking through Central Park and all of a sudden they were um, casting a Ralph Lauren thing. And I was like, I could walk through Central Park. Why not me? Why not me? That happened to Tyson Beckford. That's his story. And... Mm-hmm. Um, even though that happened 10 years after the movie, I'm very forward thinking and I envisioned that, which led yeah. to me being cast, the fact that I was such a visionary, literally. Yeah. Do, would you say you are um, a Tyson Beckford type, like where you can just walk through crowds and, and be stopped for gigs? I would say I'm Tyson Beckford's type, meaning people as beautiful as him, like schlubs schlubby kind of guys like me. Like my shoulders are at a lower 45 degree angle. There's no like suit that fits me, quote unquote, appropriately. Okay. So it's like a, like a downhill thing. Like a, yeah, it's like compliment. I'm a compliment to, um, compliment with an E, not an I to a Tyson Beckford type. When you decided to like take acting seriously, uh, was there any like turmoil or any because you know from what from other people I've interviewed, you know their parents weren't weren't really happy by the choices they made to be whatever they chose to do outside of doctors and lawyers. Did you have any animosity with your family or anything about doing this? Well, I'm a nepo baby uh, against their will. They wanted me to go into plumbing, and I'm like, nah, let me do the mm-hmm. family business. You know what I mean? Like, let me mm-hmm. let me let me go to Lee Stratusburg. I'm not even sure how you say it or. Um, what you would call, I want, I wanted to go to the Frank Stallone School of Acting, which was mm-hmm. all online, which is crazy for 1981. And it just didn't work out like paperwork. Can you, can you walk us through what it was like when you received the call saying you've gotten the part to be in Star Trek II Wrath of Khan? So I'm um, at the crib 
with my hand on the phone, like the, it was the rotary phone. Cause I'm like, yo, this thing about to ring. I can feel it. And um, sure enough, three hours later, guess what happened? Guess. Was, I'm assuming the phone rang. No, the doorbell oh, okay. rang. It okay, was a sorry. DHL sorry. package. And it was for my dad. And I was like, Dad, while you opening that, can you call the producers of Wrath of Khan and see, you know, if I could fit in there somewhere? Now, if you know me, you know, I'm very um, suggesty. I'm very like, why don't you do this E? I got a I got I did get a call the next day saying, like, yeah, come down and we'd love to humor you about you being in this picture. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I don't I'm not quite familiar with sarcasm yet. So I go down to Civil Light Studios in Queens. And they say, we only film the Cosby show here. And I'm like, whoa, not my thing. So then I go uptown to the Stratusburg studio and we do a read through. And I'm like, before we even get into the script, if that's what you want to call this thing, we started working through names. Um, my first, my first suggestion in my arc of being fired was, I thought we should call the character Sinister Farrakhan. So we worked through it. We workshopped a bunch of names. Um, I go to get some coffee and a fresca and I hear this Shaka Khan song and I hear, what would you do for me? Write that one. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, whoa, there it is. Chakra Khan, because I'm very into chakras, even though it's 1980, 1981 at the time. Were you, were you nervous? You know what I'm saying? Was, was, was this like the, at the time, was this the biggest, um, you know, gig you had received at the time? Nervous is a word not in my vocabulary. Um, anxious, uh, impatient. Annoying, like these are words that I'm familiar with, but nervous, no, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's acting. So first day on the set, you're there, mm. you see all these uh, stars, you know, all, okay. these, all these amazing actors and actresses and things like that. How was it the first day on the set? Well, I didn't, I got there and I saw all these amazing extras. They had me mm. in the holding bin as a way to humble me. You know, they don't want me immediately by uh, Dub Shats. That's what I call William Shatner. Or mm-hmm. any, or like, oh, the guy from 227 who was the black guy who got killed first. Like, they didn't want me consorting with them because they said, ooh, ooh, we'll feel like you're better served with craft services. Or like, you're not really in the movie. This is a favor to your dad. And just all these tests, you know. Mm-hmm. Gene Roddenberry loves to haze people, and um, I knew that going in. So I played the role. I served food, and I picked up things, and I hung out in the costume department a lot, mm-hmm. just waiting on when, whenever my honey bun trailer would be ready. And um, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You said your honey bun trailer? Honey bun trailer. That's where they keep all the big names who they want to surprise. So you you know like how Khan, when they reveal him, it's a big reveal. Mm-hmm. Big reveal. And I'm like, ooh, my big reveal, like when he takes off the mask, I'll be like right behind him like, aha. Okay. Okay. Yes, it's yeah. guess who, but it out of space. I heard uh, Khan really took really took it seriously in the gym. I heard he, he really took it seriously in the gym. He went crazy in the gym. And I was his muscular advisor at first. I'm like, you mm. got to flex that. You got to show that. Because mm-hmm. Kirstie Alley, God bless the dead, she wasn't given any cleavage, which is weird to me. Yeah, yeah. Because she had gifts. Mm-hmm. So they took all of the cleavage budget, gave it to Khan, and I was just going to be on the right shoulder saying, you know, just hyping them up, gassing them up. Were you given any direction to do these things you said you were doing, like writing the uh the giving the advice uh of saying you know let's go let's go kill dub shats like what were, were you given direction to say these things i'm impervious to direction and that is my on my business card flip okay. and on the other side is me doing jazz hands so you know it hasn't led to a lot of work i don't even think people use business cards anymore but they just let me go 
So let's let's get it, let's get into the gossip. Let's get it. Let's get into the, get the to tragedy. The tea. Let's get into tragedy. the tea. You know, so I got my tea now, green tea, organic with honey. I'm ready. I'm sitting down. I'm ready to go. Yes. So I watched the movie, and I like the movie. Honestly, mm. um, here's the thing, though. I didn't see you. The people want to know what happened. I removed myself, not intentionally, but mostly through my actions. Khan, first black person he sees, he says, I don't know who this is. The first thing he says. He could have just went straight to the white guy he did know and just say, hey, you look familiar. But they're like, ooh, we don't want to skip over the black people. And he's obviously here. We want to we act like he's not here. So the first thing he says, um, who is this Negro, right? Problematic. Mm -hmm. I bring light to that. Mm -hmm. I call Sidney LeMay. LeMay gets on the phone. He cussing out Gene Roddenberry. And it's like, everybody's blaming me, the guy who doesn't have clearance to even be there in the first place. Do you think that um, America was ready to see a, uh, a black character on the villain side of a movie? I don't think they were ready, but I did not care. Because immediately... After leaving the lot, I go to Gold's and I'm working out with with Sly Stallone because I'm trying to still get into Frank Stallone's acting class. Yes. So we rocking and I'm like, yo, just talking my shit. We walked the band. Three years later, Apollo Creed, they make a whole franchise after of my shit talking to Sly Stallone. All these people made money off characters I invented. And it's sad. So, have you heard from any of the other actors since you know since that fiasco? I have not spoken with any of the actors, nor have I heard from the extras. I have heard from many of the janitorial staff. We get together for karaoke, still in the village. Really, what I guess I'm trying to say is, all's well that ends well. Okay, so uh, one last question for for the listeners, so they can keep up with you. What's what's next or what's happening now for Clark LaRue Jones? What's happening now is I'm setting up my ATT wireless internet email address. Well, uh, well, thank you, Clark, for the interview. You are welcome. And uh, thank you for listening to this interview portion of The Novelizers. I have been Kevin Carter. Please enjoy the rest of the podcast. As Commander Spock would say, cool beans. Our next chapter was novelized and narrated by Joe Firestone, you know and love her from The Tonight Show, Joe Para, Z-Way, and just being so damn funny all the time. Joe? Make it so. Chapter 10, Stalling for Time. Novelized and narrated by Joe Firestone. At this point, the USS Enterprise looked pretty red and smoky. A bad sign. Admiral Kirk was in a no-win situation at this point, and so being the leader that he was, he turned around to face his crew, telling them to clear the bridge. It was tense. Everyone seemed to know what that meant and went about their business of clearing the bridge. Kirk approached Spock, his good friend and associate. Spock tried to comfort him. At least we know he doesn't have Genesis. Kirk looked worried. Just keep nodding as though I'm giving orders. Kirk was bidding for time. Biting? Bidding. Nah. Kirk was biding for time. He spoke to Kirstie Alley. Punch up the data charts of the USS Reliance Command Console and hurry! Alley knew just what to do. Aye, aye, sir, she said stoically. Khan reminded them. Forty-five seconds! He was sure being a stinker. The crew was nervous and unsure of what would happen next. However, Kirk usually did a bang-up job of leading the way, so they all hoped deep down that he had a plan. Kirk started talking to the FaceTime machine once again. Khan stood there with his hot roadie. They had been discussing official space attack business when Kirk got their attention again. Kirk pleaded with Khan, Sir, you've got to give us time. The computer's inoperative. Kirk was lying about that, but what else can an admiral do in such a crazy situation? Khan snapped back, Time is a luxury you do not have, Admiral. This was a line Khan had prepared the night before, and it came out just right. 
Kirk turned around and said, Dang, isn't that something just about all of us would say when put in that situation? He put on the readers he got for his birthday from his doctor friend and turned around to think. Allie looked at him expectantly. Khan put the pressure on with a passive-aggressive, Admiral. Kirk had to placate him with a lie. It's coming through now, Khan. All the while, the two spaceships were getting closer and closer together. Uh Uh-oh. Spock sidled up to Kirk. Reliance's prefix numbers are 1609. Allie just sat there watching. Kirk said to her, You've got to learn why things work on a starship. She was good for a young space officer, but had a lot to learn. They were trying to break into the enemy ship's computer system. Smart! On FaceTime, we could still see Khan and the cute space lifeguard deliberating. It became clear to those around him that Kirk was not going to take this situation with his pants down and a paddle to his ass. He was taking control. Using hacker logic, he had Kirstie Alley break into the Reliance console and lowered their shields, which was an absolutely wicked move. Spock reminded him the prefix combination could have changed. Khan is quite intelligent, which was Spock's way of saying, Not so fast, mister. This plan could be a whopper. Spock was always reminding Kirk to slow down and smell the roses, but Kirk never seemed to let that register. Khan reminded them over FaceTime, 15 seconds! It was getting down to the wire. Kirk turned around to the FaceTime and asked, Khan, how do we know you'll keep your word? Khan replied with another banger he had thought of the night before, just in case Kirk asked him this. I've given you no word to keep, Admiral. In my judgment, you simply have no alternative. Crushed it. Khan thought to himself. Kirk pretended to concede. I see your point. Stand by to receive our transmission. Over the computer, Khan looked like he was about to dig into a Christmas ham. Kirk turned back around and whispered to his crew, Are the phasers on target? Sulu whisper replied, Phasers are locked. They were all under immense pressure, but on the Starship Enterprise, some days were like this. Khan giddily reminded them that the 60 seconds were up and it was time to meet Khan's demands. Kirk coolly replied, Here it comes. Now, Mr. Spock. Here Khan thought Kirk was telling Spock to hand over the Genesis Project data, but Kirk was definitely talking about the phasers. Spock typed in the prefix combination to Reliance's computers, and it worked! The Reliance's shields were going down, and the space tables were turning! Over on the USS Reliance, the hunky lifeguard was shocked, witnessing this in real time. He yelled to his crew, Our shields are dropping! And Khan's jaw was dropping too. Khan insisted, Raise them! But the space hunk was at a loss. I can't! Spock's computer work made it so they couldn't control their own space console anymore. Khan was starting to go into beast mode. Where's the override? The override! Just then, we heard the word from Admiral Kirk we'd been waiting to hear this whole time. Fire. The Reliance had its shields down and was now under attack. Fire, Kirk commanded again. The USS Reliance was experiencing some pretty heavy damage and minor explosions. Khan commanded his crew to fire back, but the lifeguard reminded him they couldn't fire since the console was out of their control. The lifeguard braced Khan. We must repair the damage. The Enterprise will wait. She's not going anywhere. And with that, the Reliance sailed away. The space hunk made a good call and deserved a raise. The battle was over, for now. Back on Kirk's ship, things were still looking red, but a little less smoky. Sulu spoke first. Sir, you did it. Kirk wiped the sweat off his upper lip. I did nothing except get caught with my britches down. I must be going senile. Kirk's recent birthday had stirred up quite a bit of existential dread. Mrs. Alley, you just keep right on quoting regulations. Kirstie Alley looked somewhat ashamed, but Kirk paid her no mind. Meantime, let's find out what the hell is going on and see how bad we've been hit. Just then, the space door swooshed open. Scotty came in holding the bloody body of Midshipman Preston. Everyone was aghast. Not Midshipman Preston. Spock closed his eyes in despair. The space battle had cost them a heavy toll. A crew member's life. Joe Firestone, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that's all the entertainment you deserve for today, so I'm signing off. Kevin Carter, 
intern this spaceship to the ground. Will do, Andy. And thanks to this week's contributors, Joe Firestone, Ira Glass, Sage Boggs, Clark Jones, and Stephen Levison. The Novelizer was created by Stephen Levison, produced by Stephen, Chris Karwowski, and Rob Kuttner, and edited, mixed, and mastered by Chris Karwowski. Music by Cole Emhoff, Andrew Lynn, Mike Wilson, and Chris Messick. The recap rap was performed by me, Kevin Carter, written by Sage Boggs and recorded at Safe House Studios. Audio engineering by Andre Manuel. Special thanks to Sarah Mabe, Crystal Dennis, Dennis DeClaudio, and Hannah Levinson. Follow The Novelizers on Instagram and Twitter at The Novelizers, or visit thenovelizers.com. The Novelizers is a work of parody unauthorized by Paramount, Roddenberry Entertainment, or Star Trek. I'm Andy's intern, Kevin Carter. It's a crazy galaxy. Be safe out there.